In the early years of the 19th century, the familiar sound of thousands of marching feet had long plagued the population of Europe. Without interruption for almost 20 years, from the rise of Napoleon to his forced abdication, the awful spectre of war hovered somewhere over the continent. In 1814, Napoleon's defeat at the hands of the Allies signaled the apparent end of the tyrant, and the nations of Europe settled down to enjoy a well-earned interlude of peace and prosperity. But it was to prove short-lived. On March the 1st, 1815, Napoleon escaped from his exile on Elba and returned to France. The dogs of war were about to be unleashed again. Following his disastrous foray into Russia in 1812, Napoleon's fortunes had declined rapidly until, surrounded by armies from Britain, Austria, Russia and Prussia, the emperor was finally forced into unconditional abdication. Allowed by his enemies to retain the title of emperor, he became prince of the small Mediterranean island of Elba. From a proud army of 500,000 men, Napoleon was allowed to take with him only 600 trusted soldiers from his old guard. He personally selected these men at an emotional farewell. After choosing the men who were to be his bodyguard, the emperor called for an eagle of the old guard to be brought forward. Racked with emotion, which he could scarcely disguise, Napoleon grasped it to his breast and gave it a kiss of farewell, with the words, With this kiss, I embrace you all. Many of the grizzled veterans of Eilau, Moscow and Austerlitz, unable to bear the emotion, also broke down in tears. Shortly afterwards, the emperor took his leave of them, and on April the 28th, 1814, he boarded a British warship which was to take him to Elba and exile. He was not to be gone for long, however. Napoleon's reappearance in France and his triumphal progress from Nice to Paris has become a modern legend, but the scenes of adulation which greeted him in Paris were almost destined not to happen. The emperor had spent his year of exile on the island of Elba, fretting and pacing like a caged beast. Ever watchful of events in France, he sensed the growing discontent among the French peasantry under the restored Bourbon monarchy. He also understood the massive unrest caused by the demobilization of his huge army. Together, they created the perfect situation for his re-emergence. Always the opportunist, Napoleon had made a legendary career from his ability to react instantly to events and opportunities. He was a man of action, almost to the point of being a gambler. In 1796, he had established his reputation by his willingness to subdue the Paris mob with what he termed a whiff of grape shot. Once again, the Paris mobs were restless, and he knew he had to act before the new Bourbon regime had the opportunity to suppress the seeds of popular resistance. So on February the 26th, 1815, Napoleon set sail from Elba to France for a final throw of the dice and one last chance to restore his fortunes. When Napoleon landed at Fréjus on his return from Elba, he found an absolutely quiet, non-existent welcome. Even Marshal Massena, one of his most famous colleagues of earlier years, was commanding at Toulon, just a few miles up the coast. He just sat and did nothing, because everybody was very cautious and watchful to begin with. They didn't want to become associated with a failed cause before it even began. But as Napoleon marched inland, of course, the situation began to change. He met a regiment which had been sent to intercept him by Marshal Ney, who, by the way, was the commander-in-chief of the Bourbons ever since the abdication of Napoleon in 1814. But the soldiers, there was nearly a, a clash in a small defile, and the French soldiers which had been sent to uh, intercept him 
refused to fire on him. This is one of the famous moments when he went forward from his 1,000 members of the old guard, which he'd had with him on the island of Elba, and opened his coat and said, Solda, je suis votre empereur, fire if you wish. And that actually happened. It was a, a tremendous act of theater. But all the French soldiers, although their officers shouted, fire, threw down their muskets and started to cheer, vive l'empereur, the old magic was too strong, and joined him. Now from that moment, uh, his bandwagon was beginning to roll. And as he moved further north towards Paris, meeting several more forces sent to intercept him by the Bourbon government, same result every time. They flocked to join him at the last moment. So a wit in Paris, as Napoleon began to approach Paris, wrote on the walls outside the royal palace, a sort of graffiti at one night, my dear cousin, please do not send me any more troops. I already have enough, signed Napoleon. This was enough for Louis XVIII to decide to abandon Paris and head again for exile. Same evening, Napoleon arrived at the royal palaces inside Paris and he was de facto emperor again. But if support for Napoleon had gained a new resilience, the response of his enemies was equally resolute. In an uncharacteristic show of solidarity, Britain, Russia, Prussia and Austria swiftly reached agreement and signed the Treaty of Vienna, under which they, the Seventh Coalition, avowed that they would finally rid Europe of the ogre Napoleon. No country was to negotiate independently with him. Napoleon was not to be trusted, and above all, he was not to be allowed time to rebuild his military machine. He was to be crushed by force as soon as possible, as there could be no lasting peace until Napoleon had been decisively beaten upon the field of battle. Napoleon desperately needed to secure his position in France and naturally wished to sue for peace. As an outward display of his peaceable intentions and much to the disappointment of his old soldiers, he appeared in public in state robes rather than his famous grey overcoat and military uniform. Napoleon needed time to reconstruct his forces as the army available to him had been greatly reduced during his year of exile. He was faced with hostile enemies at every turn, and all of his overtures for peace were summarily rejected. Faced with this coalition bent on his immediate destruction, Napoleon had no alternative but to fight the campaign which was to become known as the Hundred Days, culminating in the Battle of Waterloo. His popular support was building week by week, but the strategic situation facing the emperor was desperate. Despite the fact that many of his former soldiers had flocked back to the colors, Napoleon was initially able to field an army which only amounted to some 280,000 men. Arrayed against him were the combined forces of four allied nations, which could mobilize some 800,000 men with more to follow. This numerical advantage was patently apparent to the allies, who used it to conceive a well-balanced strategy which would make the most use of their vastly superior numbers. Five separate armies were to be used to strangle the Emperor's thinly spread forces. Wellington, with an allied army of British, Dutch and Belgian troops and 110,000 strong, was to attack Paris from the direction of Brussels. His left flank was to be protected by Marshal Blücher, with 110,000 Prussians, advancing on Namur from the direction of Liège. General Schwarzenberg's first Austrian army of 210,000 men was to attack France from the direction of the Black Forest. General Fremont, with a smaller force of 75,000 Austrians and Italians, was to move through the Riviera to threaten Lyon. Finally, there were 150,000 Russians under Barclay de Tolly, who would stage a drive into France from over the Rhine. Once these forces had destroyed the local opposition, they were to converge in a move on Paris. However well conceived the strategy may have been, the reality of mobilizing and transporting vast numbers of men with the rudimentary communication system of the early 19th century meant that such a complex maneuver would take some considerable time. Rail travel was some way off, and the armies of the period could only travel by marching on foot over the vast distances involved. Consequently, only the two armies in Belgium, the British force under Wellington and the Prussian force under Blücher, were in position 
by the opening of the campaign in May 1815. The Austrians could not be expected before July, and the Russians, marching all the way from Moscow, would arrive much later still. This delay in the Allied strategy played into Napoleon's hands and gave him an opportunity to employ his favored strategy, the strategy of the central position. Napoleon's strategy for the campaign of the Hundred Days, as it is always referred to, was brilliant. Strategically, he won the campaign of 1815, but there's a very old adage in military history going back years before Napoleon's time, which reads, in strategy, there is no victory. That is to say, if you're carrying out of the strategy at the FIBA or the forward edge of the battle area, it goes wrong, no matter how brilliant the plan behind it, all will be as nothing. So what Napoleon was doing in 1815 was a repeat of his very well-tried strategy of what was known as a central position. Knowing that he had less troops than Wellington plus Blucher put together, his aim was to drive his army like a wedge in between these two enemy armies and then defeat each in turn with local superiority force using just a small covering uh, corps or so to hold off the other enemy until he could then come swing round behind them having defeated the first enemy on the first day of the battle. A brilliant scheme, but the whole thing thrown away on execution and a number of major errors made by Napoleon and by some of his key executives. The prospect of defeating the two Allied armies which were within his reach meant that Napoleon could conceivably end the campaign before the arrival of the Austrians or Russians. Political accord between Britain and Prussia was tenuous at the best of times. A crushing victory would not only split his allies, but cement his popular support in France. Furthermore, the victory against the hitherto undefeated Wellington would certainly have disastrous consequences on the stock market in England. Napoleon hoped a stock market crash might precipitate the fall of the Tory government in England and its replacement by a Whig party more sympathetic to the question of peace. Wellington was an enormously able general, highly popular with his men. Above all, he had not been beaten by the French throughout the long years of war in Spain. At 46, he was the same age as Napoleon, but suffered from none of the effects of physical decline which troubled the emperor. Although he had a reputation for aloofness, he had a genuine concern for his men, who knew that he would not carelessly squander a single life. On occasion, he had shed very real tears over casualty reports. Nonetheless, Napoleon felt confident that he would defeat Wellington and Blucher, and his plans were further shaped by the intelligence which confirmed that due to the political differences, each of the Allied armies had a separate line of communication. Wellington's army drew supplies from England via Ostend, while Blucher's Prussians drew supplies from Germany. By striking at the hinge where the two armies joined, Napoleon hoped that when threatened, his opponents would retreat away from each other towards their supplies, making it easier for him to encircle the separate armies and defeat them in detail, one after the other, on equal terms. He would do this by concentrating his single army against each army in turn, giving him a local superiority of numbers at the point of decision, thus surmounting his overall numerical weakness. It was this vital need to force the Allies to retreat away from each other which was to form the focal point of all of the events of the next few days. The armies which were to be called upon to fight the battles of the campaign of the Hundred Days had advanced little in the hundred years since the British army under Marlborough had campaigned over much the same terrain a century before. They were still split into three main arms of service, the infantry, cavalry, and artillery. The British infantry of the period were among the best drilled and disciplined troops in the world. They had consistently been victorious over the French throughout the long years of the Peninsular War, which had dragged on from 1805 to 1814. The chief infantry weapon of the period was the Brown Bess musket, which had been in use since 1745, 70 years earlier. The weapon was loaded from the muzzle, but the soldier had to first pour some gunpowder into the firing pan and close the cover. He would then pour the rest of his cartridge down the barrel of his musket 
and ram it home with the cartridge paper to act as wadding. He would then insert and ram home a spherical lead bullet before returning his ramrod into its holder beneath the barrel. The weapon was now ready to fire. This was effected by the primitive mechanism of a spark from a flint igniting the loose powder in the pan, which in turn ignited the charge in the bottom of the barrel and sent the clumsy missile on its way. Not surprisingly, weapons of the period were very inaccurate. A further danger to their effectiveness was the possibility that raw recruits in the panic of their first battle might forget to withdraw the ramrod from the barrel of the musket. The ramrod would then be fired at the enemy along with the bullet, leaving the unfortunate recruit with a weapon which he could not reload. Modern weapons invariably have rifled barrels, which impart a spin that makes the bullets fly straight, thereby bringing greater accuracy. But because of the need to load and fire quickly, the barrels of most Napoleonic muskets were left smooth. The flight of a musket ball was therefore erratic. Contemporary sources suggest that in battle, as little as 5% of shots could reasonably be expected to hit the target at any range greater than 10 yards. It was the great inaccuracy of the weapons of the period which produced the linear tactics which to the modern spectator seem almost suicidal. But the only way in which a reasonable volume of fire could be brought to bear with any hope of at least a proportion of the shots hitting their target was to draw the men up shoulder to shoulder. Against anything other than well-aimed artillery fire or musketry from the very closest of ranges, these solid formations were not quite such dangerous places to be as they would first appear. Even from the bloodiest of battles of the period, three quarters of the men could usually hope to emerge unscathed, despite standing conspicuously shoulder to shoulder all day long in massed formations. But if musket fire was not to prove too daunting for the infantry, cannon fire was a terrifying prospect. At this period, high explosive shells were still in the future. Most projectiles fired were solid cannonballs weighing between 4 pounds and 12 pounds. At a shorter distance, grape shot was used, composed of hundreds of musket balls packed into a muslin bag, which would spread out when fired bringing death and destruction to the closely packed ranks of the enemy. The solid cannonballs fired by the artillery did not explode, but instead would plough through ranks of men, tearing off limbs as they passed. Often whole files would be killed by the same cannonball as it passed through the densely packed French columns typical of the Napoleonic period. The frequent injury were the arms and legs, which were simply torn off by the brutal passage of a cannonball. This contemporary image shows the emperor meeting with an unfortunate survivor of an earlier battle. Captain Mercer was in charge of a battery of British horse artillery at Waterloo. His vivid account gives some idea of the awful violence which cannon could wreak. Being impatient of standing idle and annoyed by the French batteries on the Nivelle Road, I ventured to commit a folly for which I should have paid dearly had our Duke chanced to be in our part of the field. I ventured to disobey orders and opened a slow and deliberate fire at the battery, thinking with my nine pounders soon to silence his four pounders. My astonishment was great, however, when our very first gun was responded to by at least half a dozen of very superior calibre, whose presence I had not even suspected, and whose superiority we recognised by their rushing noise and long reach, for they flew far beyond us. I instantly saw my folly and ceased firing. They did the same the four pounders alone continuing the cannonade as before. But this was not all. The first man of my troop touched was by one of these confounded long shot. I shall never forget the scream the poor lad gave when struck. It was one of the last fired and shattered his left arm to pieces as he stood between the wagons. That scream went to my very soul before I accused myself as having caused his misfortune. I was however obliged to conceal my emotion from the men who had turned to look at him so bidding them stand to their front, I continued my walk up and down whilst Hitchens went to his assistance. A few artillery pieces fired a fused shell, ignited by firing the cannon and designed to explode on impact. But the business of ensuring that the shell exploded as it landed required careful measurement, and often the charge would lie on the ground, fizzing and spinning before it burst. 
The strict code of honor among officers of the period required them not to take cover if a shell landed nearby, but to feign indifference and await the explosion. The men forced by iron discipline to remain in lines and columns were naturally even less keen to do so. But they too would frequently have to stand stock still in the path of projectiles, which, because of their relatively slow velocity, could often be seen leaving the muzzle of the guns opposite and flying towards them, bringing death or mutilation. Sergeant Burgoyne, who had marched with Napoleon to Moscow, was firmly of the opinion that it was the artillery which won all the major French battles. However, the third section of the army would have taken exception to that. They were the cavalry, who still considered themselves the aristocracy of the battlefield. Relying on the shock of their impact to break the opposition, cavalry of the Napoleonic era were trained to close at the gallop, where they could bring their swords to bear on an enemy reeling from the force of their charge. Like the muskets of the infantry, cavalry weapons had progressed little since Marlborough's day 100 years earlier, and in some cases had actually reverted to older forms of weaponry. In the hands of Napoleon's Polish lances, the lance had made its first return to a Western European battlefield since its widespread abandonment over 200 years before. The reintroduction of the lance was not the only throwback to earlier times. The armor and helmets worn by the French cuirassiers echoed the ancient Greek hoplites who had fought the Persians nearly 2,000 years earlier. Though the rumor which spread through the British ranks that the French breastplates were bulletproof was without foundation. Against unsupported cavalry, the infantry of the period had developed an almost foolproof defense. At the approach of cavalry, they would form a hollow square, pointing outwards in all four directions, thereby creating a bristling hedge of bayonets to keep the enemy cavalry at bay. This tactic had proved its value on countless occasions throughout the Napoleonic era, and it was to serve the British well on the fateful field at Waterloo. Only once before, in the whole eight years of the Peninsular War, had French cavalry broken a formed British infantry square. At Albuera, French lances had broken into and destroyed a British infantry battalion. But this was the exception rather than the rule. In most instances, unless cavalry was supported by either artillery or infantry, the infantry square would always hold cavalry at bay. In battle, Cavalry, therefore, tended to be most effective in driving off the enemy cavalry, at which point they would join with their own infantry and artillery to force a decision on the remaining infantry. Sometimes, however, the cavalry would justify their reputation as the dandies of the battlefield, more a psychological threat than a real one. Captain Mercer saw at least one unconvincing clash at Waterloo. Amongst the multitudes of French cavalry continually pouring over the front ridge, one corps came sweeping down the slope entire and was directing its course straight for us, when suddenly a regiment of light dragoons, I believe of the German legion, came up from the ravine at a brisk trot on their flank. The French had barely time to wheel up to the left and push their horses into a gallop when the two bodies came in collision. They were at very short distance from us, so that we saw the charge perfectly. There was no check, no hesitation on either side. Both parties seemed to dash on in a most reckless manner, and we fully expected to have seen a horrid crash. No such thing. Each, as if by mutual consent, opened their files on coming near and passed rapidly through each other, cutting and pointing, much in the same manner one might pass the fingers of the right hand through those of the left. We saw but few fall. The two corps reformed afterwards, and in a twinkling both disappeared. These were the men who were ranged against each other on the morning of June the 15th, 1815. Napoleon's initial plan had gone very well. Wellington was conscious of the threat to his supply base at Ostend, and as soon as it was known that the French were on the move, he actually ordered his army to concentrate to the south and west of Brussels, effectively moving away from the Prussians, as Napoleon had anticipated. In order to try and calm some of the rumor and mounting panic which was spreading like wildfire through Brussels, Wellington accepted an invitation to attend a ball given by the Duchess of Richmond at her Brussels home. 
The civilized events of the evening were shattered by the news that Napoleon was on the move. And the calming effect which Wellington had hoped to achieve by attending a civilian function was lost, as he and his staff officers were forced to quit the ball in some haste. He now knew that he had been fooled by Napoleon, whose real intentions were becoming clearer. By concentrating his own army away from Brussels to the southwest, he had fallen for the bait, and it would take time to refocus his forces. Wellington now realized his potentially fatal error. Napoleon has humbugged me, by God. He has stolen a day's march on me. As planned, Napoleon knew he would have to fight two battles on June the 16th. The first was a holding action designed to pin down the British forces, and the second was a larger battle against the Prussians, designed to eliminate the Prussian army, at which point he would turn against the British and destroy them also. If Napoleon's strategic plans had gone magnificently well, the situation at an operational and tactical level could not have developed more badly on June the 16th. Having selected Blucher's Prussians as the main target for his forces, Napoleon ordered Marshal Ney, with the left wing of his army, to seize the vital crossroads from the British blocking force at Quatre Bras. Once the crossroads were secure, extra French forces were to be sent by that road to reinforce the Emperor, who was with the right wing in his attempt to destroy the Prussians at Ligny. The balance of Ney's command was ordered to pin Wellington's forces in place until they too could be attacked by a united French army after the defeat of the Prussians. By a combination of his own ineptitude, sloppy staff work by Napoleon's aides, and the fog of war caused by the manoeuvres and counter-manoeuvres of a huge mass of men, Marshal Ney failed in all of his crucial tasks. Firstly, he failed to secure the crossroads at Quatre Bras on June the 16th. Secondly, he failed to dispatch the support that Napoleon needed to decisively defeat the Prussians at Ligny. And finally, he allowed Wellington to disengage his forces and slip away to the north on June the 17th. The campaign of 1815 must be regarded as a group of four closely interconnected battles. Two on the 16th of June, the second day of the campaign, that is to say, Quatre Bras and Ligny, and two on the 18th of June, Waterloo, of course, but also the Battle of Vavre, seven miles away to the east of Wellington's position at Mont Saint Jean. Part of the strategy of the central position we were talking about earlier was for a force to be detached from the smaller wing to come across onto the flank and rear of the main enemy who was being attacked as number one target to add to his complete destruction. When those orders were sent for Derlon's first corps to leave Marshal Ney's force and go across country to Ligny to fall on the flank of the Prussian army there, there was total confusion. The order is given by an imperial aide-de-camp to General Derlon and he sets out with his corps. He then is intercepted by Ney's chief of staff, because Ney has suddenly turned round and seeing his second corps being marched away over the horizon, so loses his temper and says, I want those back, I don't care who's given them orders. And therefore, Derlon receives another order, a counter order, about turns and returns towards the battlefield of Quatre Bras. And because of this muddle, that corps, which had been absolutely the critical element in either the battle at Quatre Bras, had it been there all the time, or at the Battle of Ligny, had it arrived there when it should have done, would have won the whole campaign for Napoleon without a doubt. But in fact, it never fights at either battlefield. It is wandering around between the two. Due to a bout of lethargy on the part of Marshal Ney, the Battle of Quatre Bras had begun late. Nonetheless, the vital crossroads were still held by only 4,000 men, and a determined French attack by the 50,000 men at Marshal Ney's disposal could easily have taken the position. But the caution of Ney, who had been defeated by Wellington in Spain, led to an ineffectual series of attacks which gradually escalated into a full-scale pitched battle, as the British were able to bring up more and more reinforcements. The effect of this battle was doubly disastrous for Napoleon, who at the time was fighting the Prussians at Ligny. Because Ney had failed to support the Emperor with Derlon Corps, the Prussian army was able to escape the Battle of Ligny more or less intact, despite a severe mauling and the loss of 17,000 men. <laughs> 
they escaped from the clutches of the French armies and headed not eastwards towards Liège, as Napoleon believed, but north towards Wavre. Napoleon had seen masses of deserters and Prussian ambulances fleeing in the direction of Liège, and these he mistakenly took for the main Prussian army obligingly heading in retreat along its line of supply away from Wellington. Accordingly, he was very slow in ordering Marshal Grouchy's corps to pursue the Prussians. So they, like the British at Quatre Bras, were able to elude their French pursuers with catastrophic consequences for Napoleon. By June the 17th, the British and Prussians were both in retreat northwards. Blücher had been missing all night since June the 16th, trapped under his fallen horse at Ligny. His replacement, Neithenau, was about to order the Prussians to retreat away from Wellington towards Germany, but chose to first concentrate his army together before doing so. At that crucial moment, Blücher returned and forbade them to retreat. He knew the importance of supporting Wellington and would do everything in his power to come to the aid of the British. So all the time, the Allies were moving parallel as they marched north, not away from each other as Napoleon had planned. Crucially, Napoleon's intelligence had broken down, and he did not re-establish contact with either of his opponents until late on June the 17th. By then, Wellington had taken the fateful decision to stand and fight at Waterloo on June the 18th. He did so in the knowledge that the Prussian forces, only eight miles away at Vav, would be able to come to his aid that same day. Napoleon, unaware that the Prussians were so close, was confident that they were continuing to retreat, pursued by Grouchy, who had confidently assured the Emperor that he would keep the Prussian army on the move from Wellington. Accordingly, Napoleon took the decision to switch the emphasis of his attack to Wellington's undefeated army, and he personally supervised the disposition of his army on the morning of June the 18th, convinced that all he had to do was to defeat Wellington's army and he would have time to destroy the fleeing Prussians at his leisure. The battlefield at Waterloo measures barely three miles from east to west and a mere one and a half miles from north to south. The Duke of Wellington's Anglo-Dutch-Belgian army took up its position on a small ridge set slightly south of the village of Mont-Saint-Jean. Traditionally, Wellington had defied contemporary military practice, which was to draw up one's forces facing the opposition where they were at the mercy of enemy cannon fire. He instead insisted on positioning the bulk of his forces on the reverse of the slope, where they were sheltered from the worst effects of enemy artillery. The British troops were also encouraged to lie down and take shelter when not actively in action. These prudent measures not only saved lives, but won the respect of the men, who naturally had more loyalty for a commander who spared them from unnecessary danger. The steadfastness of the British troops probably owed a great deal to this sensible policy. Other commanders were to be less thoughtful, however. During the coming battle, Bliant's Dutch troops were badly mauled by French artillery. They were one of the few formations to be placed on the forward slope in full view of the French. On the French side of the battlefield, Napoleon's troops were arrayed on a ridge facing the British. Between them lay a gentle valley intersected by two main roads and broken by the grounds of a chateau known as Hougamont and a small farm, La Haye Sainte. Wellington's Allied army was composed of British, Dutch and Belgian troops with some German elements. It totaled some 68,000 men that day, comprising 50,000 infantry, only 20,000 of which were British, and 12,400 cavalry and 156 cannon serviced by five and a half thousand gunners. On the French side of the field were 49,000 infantry, nearly 16,000 cavalry and 246 cannon served by 7,000 gunners, a force of roughly 72,000 men, which meant that Napoleon had succeeded in bringing superior numbers to bear against the British, but only just. Compared to Napoleon's earlier plans for such great battles as Austerlitz or Jena, the plan for Waterloo was decidedly disappointing. 
It reflects his complete scorn for Wellington, the sepoy general, as he called him. And at breakfast, at the famous occasion before the battle opened, with his generals around the table, he would say, this matter will worry me no more than eating my breakfast. Because his plan was just to smash through by a series of hammer blows uh, through the centre of Wellington's line, occupy the vital crossroads, which formed the core of Wellington's position, and then he would advance on Brussels, where he was confident of reaching that evening. And the campaign, the war, would be over, and Napoleon would be back with a vengeance. Drenched from overnight storms, as the sodden troops of both armies raised themselves from their muddy bivouacs, they cursed the night of June the 17th that had seen torrential floods of rain. The troops had spent the night in the open, and much of the ground had been reduced to a muddy quagmire, which inhibited the bounce and ricochet of the cannonballs, which were the cause of many of the casualties inflicted by the artillery. In muddy ground, the cannonballs would simply sink in at first contact and do no further harm. Confident that the Prussian army was too far off to aid the British, Napoleon therefore allowed himself the luxury of letting two hours pass in order to allow the sodden fields of Waterloo to dry out. On the British side, Wellington was content to wait, as he knew that every hour which passed was an hour gained for the Allies, as it brought their Prussian allies nearer. Unaware of the workings of grand strategy, the troops passed the time in looking to their own comfort and foraging as best they could. June 18th, memorable day. Sometime before daybreak, the bombardier who had been dispatched to Langevelt returned with a supply of ammunition. With the providence of an old soldier, he had brought a quantity of beef, biscuit and oatmeal, of which there was abundance scattered about everywhere. There were casks of rum, and having broached one of these, he and his drivers, every one filled his canteen. A most considerate act, and one for which the whole troop was sincerely thankful. The rum was divided on the spot. Unaware of the approaching threat posed by the Prussians, Napoleon still waited until finally, at 11.25 a.m., the French Grand Battery opened fire and the French forces rolled forward to attack. This initial attack took the form of a diversion directed against the Hougoumont Chateau, occupied by the British Guards Brigade. But the fighting for the chateau and its grounds gradually escalated as it became a miniature battle in its own right, which sucked in far more French troops than rightfully should have been allocated to gain such a slight prize. The bitter fight for the chateau continued all day as the troops fought on, oblivious to events on other parts of the field. At one point, the French succeeded in fighting their way into the courtyard, but the massive axe-wielding Frenchman who led the assault and the men with him were cut down to a man and the gates barred shut behind them. This was to be the only foothold gained by the French on the chateau that day, in an action which was to gradually draw in one and a half divisions of French troops, some 10,000 men in total, against a force of a mere 2,500 defenders from the British Guards Brigade. As the early stages of the struggle for Hougoumont raged, and Derlon prepared his corps for the main French attack upon the British centre, daunting news reached the Emperor. For the first time, he learned that the Prussians were not in fact retreating towards Germany and that they had managed to elude Grouchy. Worse still, they were on their way and would come to the aid of the British by attacking the exposed French right flank. Napoleon was therefore forced to draw off a large portion of his reserves to guard his flank before the battle had really started, and he would then have to fight with one eye over his shoulder. Nonetheless, he still felt confident that his men would defeat Wellington before the arrival of Blücher and his Prussians. Grouchy had failed in his mission to keep Blücher and Wellington apart, but Napoleon now desperately needed Grouchy's men to rejoin his main army at Waterloo, and he dispatched urgent messages ordering Grouchy, with his 20,000 troops, to rejoin the main army immediately. Fighting was by now general all along the line. In addition to the fierce struggle around Hougoumont, another siege was underway, as French troops battled to capture the farm of La Haye Sainte, held by the men of the King's German Legion. 
the struggle raged all day, until eventually, with their ammunition spent, the Germans were expelled from the farm at five o'clock in the afternoon. As the fight for La Haye Sainte raged, Napoleon sent urgent messages to Grouchy. While the Emperor's concentration was on Grouchy, Derlon's corps had launched a series of furious attacks on the British lines. This was a critical moment for the British. With four massed French divisions supported by cavalry and artillery, moving against a thinly held British right of center, mustering only 3,000 infantry with no infantry reserve behind them. The situation did indeed look black for Wellington. But the day was to be saved by the heroic actions of the British cavalry. It was the Household Brigade to the right of La Haye Sainte and the Union Brigade to the left who spurred forward at the charge and swept back the massed French attacks. In their enthusiasm for the fight, however, the Scots Greys of the British Union Brigade swept through the French infantry and onto the French lines. With their horses blown, there they should have rallied and retreated back up the slope. But egged on by their fellow Scots regiment, the 92nd, all crying Scotland forever, the Greys plunged on across the valley to attack the French artillery. In a fury of purpose, they silenced the French guns and sabred the gunners without mercy. In their excitement, however, the Greys had gone too far, and their exhausted horses now proved too slow to carry home their elated riders. Pursued by fresh French cavalry and a regiment of lancers, most of the Scots Greys met death that day. It is estimated that of 2,500 horsemen of the Union Brigade who charged, fully a 1,000 were to become casualties. Despite these losses, the first main French attack had been repulsed and the crisis in the British centre averted. However, all along the British line, a hard-fought battle was still in doubt. The British situation appeared grim, as Captain Mercer recalled. Colonel Gould, Royal Artillery, came to me perhaps a little later. Uh, be that as it may, we were conversing on the subject of our situation, which appeared to him rather desperate. He remarked that in the event of a retreat, there was but one road, which no doubt would be instantly choked up, and asked my opinion. My answer was, it does indeed look very bad, but I trust in the Duke, who I am sure will get us out of it somehow or other. Meantime, gloomy reflections arose in my mind. For though I did not choose to betray myself, as I spoke before the men, yet I could not help thinking that our affairs were rather desperate, and that some unfortunate catastrophe was at hand. In this case, I made up my mind to spike my guns and retreat over the fields, draft horses and all, in the best manner I could, steering well from the high road and general line of retreat. It was fortunate for the British cause that Mercer did not retreat as he and his battery were sorely needed in the next major action of that desperate day. Marshal Ney had observed what he took to be signs of an impending retreat in the British center and made the ruinous decision to order a major attack by French cavalry. All it needed, Ney reasoned, was one last psychological blow which the appearance of massed cavalry would provide. Accordingly, his cavalry advanced completely unsupported by artillery or infantry, only to find the well-prepared British squares ready to receive them as they crossed the ridge. Twelve times the magnificent horsemen surged forward, and twelve times they were repulsed by the fire from the British squares and artillery, among them Mercer's troop. The spectacle was imposing, and if ever the word sublime was appropriately applied, it might surely be to it. On they came in compact squadrons, one behind the other, so numerous that those at the rear were still below the brow when the head of the column was but at some 60 or 70 yards from our guns. Their pace was a slow but steady trot. None of your furious galloping charges was this, but a deliberate advance at a deliberate pace, as of men resolved to carry their point. On our part was equal deliberation. Every man stood steadily at his post. The guns ready? Loaded with round shot first and a case over it. The tubes were in the vents. The port fires glared and sputtered behind the wheels. And my word alone was wanting to hurl destruction on that goodly show of gallant men and noble horses. <laughs> 
I thus allowed them to advance unmolested until the head of the column might have been around 50 or 60 yards from us, and then gave the word, fire. The effect was terrible. Nearly the whole leading rank fell at once, and the round shot penetrating the column carried confusion throughout its extent. The ground, already encumbered with the victims of the first struggle, became now almost impassable. Still, however, those devoted warriors struggled on, intent only on reaching us. The thing was impossible. Our guns were served with astonishing activity. We were a little below the level of the ground on which they moved, having in front of us a bank of about a foot and a half or two feet high, along the top of which ran a narrow road, and this gave more effect to our case shot, all of which almost must have taken effect, for the carnage was frightful. At the instant I thought it was all over with us, they turned to either flank and filed away rapidly to the rear. Retreat of the mass, however, was not so easy. Many facing about and trying to force their way through the body of the column, that part next to us became a complete mob, into which we kept a steady fire of case shot from our six pieces. The effect is hardly conceivable, and to paint this scene of slaughter and confusion impossible. Every discharge was followed by the fall of numbers, whilst the survivors struggled with each other, and I actually saw them using the pommels of their swords to fight their way out of the melee. Some rendered desperate at finding themselves thus pent up at the muzzles of our guns, as it were, and others, carried away by their horses, maddened with wounds, dashed through our intervals, few thinking of using their swords, but pushing furiously onward, intent only on saving themselves. At last, the rear of the column, wheeling about, opened a passage, and the whole swept away at a much more rapid pace than they had advanced. The repulse of the massed French cavalry charges by the resolute British squares was to prove the decisive moment of the battle. Conditions in these squares had become almost unbearable. Choked by clouds of smoke, piled high with dead and wounded, they could not hold out much longer. But by four o'clock, the leading elements of the Prussian army had at last reached the battlefield, and by five o'clock, they had captured the village of Plans Noir on the French right, thus threatening to outflank the whole French position. Once before, at Borodino in 1812, Napoleon had lost a vital opportunity to win a crucial battle by his refusal to commit the Imperial Guard. These men were by far his most valuable troops, experienced and battle-hardened veterans who formed his personal bodyguard. This time, there would be no mistake. Two battalions of the Old Guard swept into Plans Noir and expelled 14 battalions of Prussians at the point of the bayonet. In so doing, they stabilized the situation for the French. The battle was still there, to be won or lost. It could still very easily have been won by Napoleon. Marshal Ney had at last managed to organize a series of concerted attacks utilizing cavalry, artillery and infantry, and together they were causing huge losses in the British center, which, worn down during a day's dogged resistance, was at last beginning to show signs of wavering. At this desperate juncture, Ney begged Napoleon for fresh troops. He knew that one last supreme effort would carry the day. Still wary of the volatile situation around Plans Noir, Napoleon delayed for a crucial half an hour. Making full use of this merciful respite, Wellington was able to shore up his hard-pressed center. It was not until seven o'clock in the evening that Napoleon relented and the battalions of the Imperial Guard rolled forward. The old guard, the oldest of the old, remained in square as a rallying point, while the second and third battalions of the guard regiments, the so-called middle guard, assaulted the British positions. They were met by a resolute resistance by the British brigade of guards, who poured forth such a hail of fire that the unthinkable happened. The Imperial Guard, never before defeated, halted and began to give ground. Sensing that the decisive moment had come, Wellington himself urged their commander on. Now, Maitland, now's your time, he cried. At that moment, the whole British line sprang forward almost as one man. The French will to resist seemed to crumble. As the Imperial Guard retreated, the news spread rapidly through the French ranks. Le Garde recule. The Guard is retreating, 
was the astonished cry which carried through the ranks, but it was soon replaced with a sauve qui peut, every man for himself. In an instant, French morale disintegrated, and by one of those sudden strange shifts of mass consciousness, Napoleon's army was transformed from an aggressive fighting machine to a struggling mob of fugitives as panic spread throughout the army and any semblance of military discipline evaporated. The Allied pursuit was merciless, and thousands of Frenchmen were cut down, adding to the already horrendous toll of dead and wounded. The Emperor himself retreated to the safety of the rallying square formed by the Old Guard. Then, unable to force his carriage through the mob of fugitives, he was forced to take to his horse and flee the field with a small escort just one more panic-stricken figure in the total rout. He left behind 47,000 dead and wounded men of both sides, a sad and heart-rending spectacle, which was to linger forever in the memory of the participants, among them Captain Mercer. I got to look round and contemplate a battlefield by the pale moonlight. The night was serene and pretty clear, a few light clouds occasionally passing across the moon's disk and throwing objects into transient obscurity added considerably to the solemnity of the scene. Oh, it was a thrilling sensation thus to stand on the silent hour of the night and contemplate that field. All day long the feature of noise and strife, now so calm and still. Here and there some poor wretch, sitting up amidst countless dead, busied himself in endeavours to staunch the flowing stream with which his life was fast ebbing away. Many whom I saw so employed that night were, when morning dawned, lying stiff and tranquil as those who had departed earlier. From time to time a figure would half raise itself from the ground and then with despairing groan fall back again. Others, slowly and painfully rising, stronger or having less deadly hurt, would stagger away with uncertain steps across the field in search of succour. Many of these I followed with my gaze until lost in the obscurity of distance. But many, alas, after staggering a few paces, would sink again on the ground, probably to rise no more. It was heart-rending, and yet I gazed. However complete, the defeat of the French forces, the death and destruction wrought on the field of Waterloo did not instantly signal the end of the French hopes. In his long career, Napoleon had more than once salvaged his armies from the jaws of a seemingly irreversible defeat. After Waterloo, Napoleon, of course, went straight back to Paris to try to keep control of the political machinery there. He could, in my opinion, and it is only opinion because this did not happen historically, have still one of the campaign of Waterloo at the last instance had been called the Battle of Paris, no doubt. Because by the time he had got back to Paris, there were something like 120,000 French troops accumulating around the city, including Grouchy's right wing, which had been fighting at Vavre, of course, and had retreated in very good order on the 19th onwards back towards Paris. The Allies, on the other hand, pursuing Napoleon's army, which was getting stronger and stronger, in a sense, as it assimilated reserves, uh, the Allies were getting weaker and weaker because they had to drop off forces to besiege this and that fortress as they advanced deeper and deeper into France. Until by the time you get the Allies on the outskirts of Paris, they're down to something like a joint 85,000 men. That's Prussians and Allies added together. Napoleon has got 120,000 men. On the psychological side, the French were defeated as from the evening of the 18th of June. But in the pure physical side, no, they could have stood and fought. And anybody can argue the amount of psychological disadvantage they were suffering under would have been more than compensated for by the strength of forces fighting on their own territory, in their own choice positions, exactly where they wanted to, under a Napoleon who was now raring to get revenge for the slight upon his reputation which Waterloo was bound to mean. Well, the argument goes on. It'll continue to do so for many years yet. History records that Napoleon was fated not to be allowed his final chance. The victorious allies wanted no mistake a second time, and the emperor was collected by a British warship and sent once more into exile, this time to the inhospitable Atlantic island of St. Helena. 
There he spent his last remaining days, reflecting on his former glories and turning over and over in his mind what might have been. Had Ney taken Cat Bra? Had Grouchy arrived? Had Blucher retreated east? These were the issues to which the fallen emperor returned again and again. As his physical health and spirit declined, he was no longer the proud emperor, but already the myths were beginning to grow around him as his old soldiers slipped away one by one. But in his heart, he was still the man of great destiny whose very name lent itself to a whole era, the age of Napoleon.